first car was a 51 Ford sedan. I had never had anything to do with Model A Fords, so I had to learn. But if you're interested and you work hard enough at it, you learn as you go. Uh, I started uh, restoring cars in 1960. My wife's brother had one all done, and he gave me a ride in it, and that convinced me I ought to be doing the same thing. <laughs> The, uh, all the Model A engines in use are old engines. They don't make new ones. Um, but there are people around that rebuild them. They rebore them. And so we're all, everybody's using old engines. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the big thing. Not so much Model A, but the early V8s. They got to take the original engine out and put in a great big chrome hoopty doopy engine. They, they, they like that. I, I'd like to keep them like they used to be. Um, I, I've driven it to Bennington and back. That's the longest trip I've made with that one and the green one. I went to Bennington. Um, what I like to do is just go out like an afternoon like this and just tour around the back roads. Just drive nice and slow and watch the leaves and the birds and all that. So that's more fun to me than going on the long trip. They don't drive easy. No power steering or anything. I put signal lights on it. It didn't have to begin with, but I figure for safety reasons, they ought to have signal lights because you can't get the window down quick enough to make a left-hand turn or stick your arm out, see? So that's not original. And the other thing that's not original is that other second number plate. But if you have signal lights, you gotta have a light over there. So that's why that's there. I think that's the only thing in the car that's not original. Um, even the upholstery is the original style. I mean, it's brand new, but it's the original style that was in the car when we got it. Yeah, yeah word gets around. An awful lot of people know that I have Motley's. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, oftentimes they're out here when they go by and word just travels. So, yeah. The first, the, the green one downstairs came from Westminster West, and the old pickup came from somewhere up in Vermont, I forget where, up mid-state. But it's wherever you can find them. One of the questions that I usually get asked is how fast will it go? <laughs> um, they'll go 50, 55 miles an hour. But, uh, you know, 40 is a better speed just enjoy you're not trying to get somewhere in a hurry you're not racing at least i'm not i'm out for the enjoyment so. I was, grew up outside New York City. I was a city girl when I moved yeah. up here. And then before long I found myself digging dandelions. Went to University of Vermont, met my husband there. We got married and he was a Vermonter and moved to Putney in 1952. So it was a complete change, but a good one. I've been here more years than a lot of people. It was hard work at first. Yeah. Maybe you could buy a shovel one week and then another week you could buy a wheelbarrow. It didn't come ready-made. I learned a lot just by working at the nursery more than I would have learned studying botany and whatever, whatever. Yeah. But it was a full-time job and the kids grew up. They would hang around. They didn't work at that point yeah. because we had four kids and they were all kind of little. But later on, my older son, Bruce, worked in the nursery with the landscaping crew. And my younger daughter, Patricia, worked at the nursery in the summer. I most, well, I worked in the packing shed um, in the spring when we shipped plants all over the world. 
uh, perennials and wildflowers. And it was an all season thing because we did wreaths at Christmas as well as selling plants the rest of the, though we, I shouldn't say all season because in January, February, uh, it was too cold. Plant people, we used to say, are always good people. Mm -hmm. And we really hardly ever had a bad check or anything like that because they were plant flower people and uh, they were nice people and they came back many, many years and some of them several times during the season. And so a lot of them became our friends really and oh, okay. were disappointed <clears throat> when we sold the nursery. But uh, while we were running the nursery in 1981, I think, what, 71? No, 71, we bought Linden Gardens for any possibility of moving a nursery. Yeah. And we did like the, the spot, the people, and we mailed catalogs out all over the country. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of people from around the country and the wreaths went to all over the country too. So um, I don't think we ever would have thought about moving anywhere else, either ourselves or the business, because, yeah. because we liked it here. I'm Conrad, and I'm here with Steve Anderson. I taught at Marlboro for a couple of years also when I first came up here, and I worked for the experiment, SIT. I first got connected with them when I was in college. They were looking for leaders to take groups to Europe and other places, but Europe. And I had just gotten back from the Army, I was two years in Europe, and I spoke pretty good German, so I, my first my leadership job was to Germany. What I really wanted to do was to go to the Balkans because I was interested in European affairs. And so they said, well, go to the Germany and see how you do, and if you do okay, then you can go to the Balkans the next year. So I did. So I led, two years I led experiment groups to, to Yugoslavia. Uh, it's a good thing for international peace if young people from different countries can not just see each other, but actually live together for a few weeks or even for a couple of months. So what the experiment did was uh, arrange for groups of high school kids to go abroad and to stay in a community, and each one of them lived with a different family. Ideally, the family had a kid their own age, so they would you know, get some contact, and then at the end of the month, the whole group, the foreigners and the Americans together, would take a trip through the country. So the Americans could see it through their eyes, and the, and the, the natives could see how the Americans reacted to their you know, to their country. And it was, a, it was a very good idea and a very good principle. And it started before World War II. And during the Second War, they went to South America. And then when the war ended, it picked up again in Europe. And they sent groups practically every European country. Back in 1978, Wyndham College was in dire straits and it was actually closing. And I uh, had a family, three children, and uh, needed to support them. So I looked for another job. And one thing that was uh, opening up then was chimney sweeping, because this was a time when the uh, oil embargo had made a lot of people turn to wood and heat. So I became a chimney sweeper with two other friends and uh, did it for nine years. I called myself a chimney doctor because I had a PhD in political science. Had a lot of fun, managed to support my family then, and uh, enjoyed <laughs> particularly wearing the costume. I wore tails and I wore this hat. and. Uh, my wife worked with me uh, some of the time. She wore a hat too. The most interesting thing about it, really, was uh, meeting so many different people and going to their homes and seeing how people lived <laughs> very differently from the very sort of, uh, not poverty stricken exactly, but certainly very simple houses to the most magnificent ones. They, they all needed their chimneys clean, and um, Jack and I came and did the job. There was no lack of business. We didn't, I, the only advertisement I'd ever had was a, a, a yellow pages, and that <clears throat> had all the business I could possibly handle. And the business is still going, by the way. When I finished with the chimney sweep, we were just in the process of buying Hickory Ridge House. It was built in 1807, and it has uh, four of the six rooms have fireplaces in them. A great, if you've ever been over there, you should take a look at it. It's a great, it's a really big building. The rooms are, the rooms are big, the ceilings are high. Very elegant, and um, 
We just had a wonderful time running it. Met a lot of interesting people. Spent a lot of time making beds <laughs> and cooking and cleaning bathrooms. We never had any help. My wife and I did it by ourselves. We arranged very early that we wouldn't both try to do breakfast at the same time. So one morning she would do breakfast and I would serve table. 16 years we had that. We probably had several thousand guests over that period. Had a wonderful time. The, the innkeeping was every bit as much fun as chimney sweeping. <laughs> it really was. Again, because we met so many different people. Even people from abroad, Japanese and Germans and French. Thanks for letting me interview you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Oh, it was great. How far back do you want to go? Well, I was born and raised in East Putney. Went to school in East Putney until the seventh and eighth grade. Then we were transported over to the Putney Central. I was there until I was 16 years old. Then I went to work in the paper mill. Of course, I had gone to high school. But then I had to leave high school to come home to go to work because my dad was sick. And that's where I was most of the time until after the war, World War II. Then after the war, when my husband came home, we, he built a house up at the top of Kimball Hill, which now is Frost Road. And that's where we lived, and I still do. in those days, well, when it was winter, we'd go sliding. One of our neighbors had a, well, it was one of those long sleds, toboggans, they call them. We used to walk way up to the top of the hill where they lived and slide all the way down to the bottom of Loomis's hill. We played with the neighbor's kids, and that was it. We never had sleds or bicycles or things like that because we couldn't afford them. Yeah, well, there was nine of us. Well, it was great because the oldest ones were gone before I was born. When I was little, there was just about four of us that were home at that time. It was very hard because my mother didn't work, but she did. She used to help taking in laundries going down to a farm and picking up potatoes. That's how we got our potatoes for the winter. And of course, all the other things, we used to have to help her. Me and my sister had to help my mother can vegetables so we'd have them through the winter. Because, you know, we never was able to get to the store. We had a Mr. Davis that owned the Putney General Store when I was growing up. And he had a wagon with a horse, and he used to deliver, you know, things like, he didn't deliver meat, but dried goods. Uh, I think maybe only once a week. Has this Putney here changed? Oh, definitely, oh, definitely. I used to be able to sit in my window at the top of Kimball Hill and know every car and every person that walked down Kimball Hill. But now, there's just a very little handful. Well, I liked school. I liked learning. I liked reading. I liked books. I started school at the Four Corner School in Marlboro, which was a one-room schoolhouse with one teacher and eight grades and 13 students. And I liked it very much. 
um, you'd learn reading and arithmetic sort of individually and then other subjects like music or history. She'd teach the whole school at once. And I went to the local school and then I went to the University of Chicago Elementary School. Then we moved to Evanston and I went to seventh and eighth grade. Then I went to the high school. Then I came, we came back to Chicago and I went to a girls school. Then I went to Smith College for two years, and then I went in my junior year abroad to Switzerland and uh, studied political science, international relations, and went to England, and there I did a graduate degree with a thesis, and then I did two teaching degrees. So I went did a lot of schools. Well, I taught history first in the East End of London in a girls school and I taught there then um, well I taught in a what's a really a girls finishing school where the girls were extremely well behaved they never did anything upsetting at all and I I also taught at a school in Scotland, and I started my own school in Scotland based on the principle that people, everyone learns in a different way and at a different pace, and teach everyone in their way that they needed, you, because you can learn to read and write and do sums in almost every subject that there is. You just have to introduce these things and not call them English or arithmetic or something like that. It's student-based teaching so that students learn and, and become enthusiastic over their learning because they're part of it. And I was regional director for Europe and the Middle East when I retired. There is one thing that's interesting, might be of interest to you. The underground room by Heller's. You walk up the old road and you look off to one side and it looks like a fireplace. And you go over there and you move some of those rugs back and you can go right down into a room. It's, it's uh, tall enough so you can stand up. They say that that is a middle and there is four more. Not exactly like that, but made at the same time. Around in a circle around it. I know where three of them are, but I don't know where the fourth one is, and I don't know anybody that knows where. I, I have no idea who might not know, but if you ever get a chance, you ought to go up and see that. That's, that's neat. And they, it's real old, old. They say they use it as an underground railroad, got the slaves go through, but I think it goes back further than that. The other place, one of them is, well, it's um, down by an old sugar house below this round cellar hole. That is, uh, it's, it's built right into the bank. You walk in the door and it opens up into a, well, it's a narrow room. It's not quite as wide as this room. But what really is fascinating about it is the rocks that make the ceiling. They're bigger than this table. How do you move a chair? And they're, they're like that. How do you move something like that? And they don't come from anywhere. They must come from someplace nearby, but I don't know. There's no sign of where they come from. Then there's another one that you can't get close to because that's on private land, but it's right beside the road. There's three rooms to that one. That one, the roof is caving in. But you go in the first room. I've never been in it because it, the roof had caved in by the time I got it. But you go in the first room and then you go into a second room and then do a third room. And every one of them has ceiling stones and they're not just one stone, it's, they're overlapped to make the ceiling and it's as big as this table. That's kind of weird. That's two of them. The third one is on Banning Road. That isn't a room. 
that's almost looks like a sacrificial stone. It's a stone about half as big as this table, and there's a uh, groove goes all the way around and comes down here, as if something, some kind of liquid, had gone into that groove and then would come down there. So now I've told you all the lies I can think of. <laughs> no, they're not lies. <laughs> Since uh, 1975, I was born in Plymouth, Mass, and raised in Duxbury. Today they call it Deluxebury, down on the ocean. A bachelor's in zoology, maths of zoology, maths of veterinary nutrition, DVM, 379 credit hours. One of my clients out there was an oil man, and he used to raise quarter horses. He'd have 20 to 30 full a year. That's what I call a horse farm, which is something. But I did a lot of hog work, cattle, sheep, goats, and poultry. My granddad had a dairy farm. Um, he milked 100 Holsteins and 12 um, jerseys when I was a little kid over in New Hampshire and Windham. Today, it's hard to find a cow in Windham. It's between Nashua and Derry. And I used to ride with Dr. Bent. Dr. Bent always wore a suit. We go to a farm, he'd take clean overalls, go into the house, put on the clean overalls, work on an animal. He was a Cornell graduate. And then he'd come out, dirty overalls in the box, have his suit on, go to the next call, very meticulous. I watched him in about 20 minutes sew an eight inch incision on a giant percheron and the animal never moved. I have horses. Which is amazing. So that's where I got the impetus to be a veterinarian. I'll tell you about the best case I ever had and the smartest okay. horse I ever dealt with. She showed up at our clinic she had a V8 juice can in her mouth. The cover was stuck in her tongue. And um, by golly, she let me use wire cutters. And I cut both sides. She never moved ahead. I had no tranquilizer in her or anything else. And uh, if my wife was here and the people who worked for me, they would back me up. She let me get that out. She opened her mouth when I you know, approach your mouth wide. She let me take the top of the can out because it was sticking this way, right? Here's the front. And then she let me vocalize the tongue. It was that deep. And she let me put absorbable sutures in, about six of them, in her tongue. Never closed her mouth, never moved her head. That is intelligence and trust, which is really something, and she healed up well. You'd be surprised, I never met a dumb animal. But on the farm, my my granddad asked me, he said, now Ben, what's the most stupid animal we got here? I said, I don't know, Graham. He said, well, he says, a chicken. I said, why? Well, he crosses the road over there and sits here two hours wondering why. <laughs> But you know what, a lot of kids, they, um, they, they never have much to do with the grandparents. And you know what, grandparents are wonderful teachers. Well, if we can extend Putney to include Westminster West, is that possible? Yeah, yeah. It has the same zip code, same 387, okay. Um, since, well, it's complicated. Starting in 1966 for 10 years in Westminster mm -hmm. West. And then we were away for 14 years in Scandinavia and in Amherst. And then we came back in 1990 and have lived since then in Putney. I think the people. The people are so open, so so caring, and so helpful to each other, and that makes this a very special place to live. Sixties were like. 
uh, we were living in Westminster West, mm -hmm. and uh, at this time there was the Westminster West has a school, a mm -hmm. little one-room schoolhouse. There was only one room at that time, and it went through grades two, one and two. Wow! That was all that were in that school, yeah. and the town <laughs> decided that um, the third graders, no, excuse me, it also had third grade there, and they decided that it was time to start sending the, the school kids close down this school and send them over to Westminster. Mm -hmm. Going over the mountain and you know, making quite a trip on the school wow. bus. Wow! And huh. we, a number of us, our parents, we had a son there then, and decided we really did not want yeah. our kids making that big trip. Mm -hmm. So what did we do? Right in tune with the 60s, we started our own school. Wow! Oh, started our own school. Uh, one, of the, one of the family's sons said, uh, "Well, uh, I've got a big house here." No reason why we can't have a school right here. That's a wow. So another another person said, "Well, uh, I've got an extra bedroom. You know, let's hire a teacher. And the teacher can live with us." And this is the kind. This is what happened. We had about fifteen kids, and they were in grades three, four, three to six. Yeah. And we hired a teacher, and um, just things went wonderfully. And then uh, one other parent came forth and he said, well, you know, I've got a piece of land right in Westminster West, and I've been wanting to put a house on it. Now, do you guys all think you could help me build that house? And then we can use it for a school, and when you don't want it, we don't want it as a school anymore, then I can sell the house and, you know, everything will be fine. So we all pitched in and built the house. That's the kind of thing that still goes on here. Yeah. There are just lots of arts, crafts, people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what gives this area such a wonderful flavor. Yeah. And, you know, why we like living here. Mm. Yeah. And I guess the other thing too is, as you said, yeah, you cut your own wood and you do your... That's an important thing here. I am 81 years old and I've lived in Putney. I was born in Putney and three years I lived in California. So I've actually, I'm a lifetime Vermonter, Putneyite. I came here in first grade and uh, there was like, all the desks were going up and down and um, there was a, maybe four of us in the first grade and that. So she just had us, you know, the big sixth graders were in the back. And um, when, when it was our lesson time or reading time, we just kind of went in a group up front. But we more or less all learned together. In the winter, we probably were, were sliding down the hill, but we were outside for every recess and if it rained, I don't know what we did. Our teacher was very nice. Her name was Mrs. Miss Chamberlain. Halfway through my second grade, she got married, and we were all invited to her wedding in Dummerston, and then she was Mrs. Lamorter. And uh, we had a hard time going from Miss Chamberlain to Mrs. Lamorter, but she was my teacher all the time. I was here for five, five grades. When I lived just down the road here, half a mile, we walked to school. In the winter, in the summer, you know, we walked. And there was a whole lot of kids in our neighborhood, so there were four or five of us that walked up together. Um, Mrs. Braley, who lived in the Braley farm over here, brought over hot lunches for us. And we had a lot of tapioca pudding, and I don't like it to this day, because she made it most every day. Usually after school, we all went home. We really didn't have much homework myself back then. Um, so we played outside. And we had chores. And we always had a big garden. And my family had a couple of cows and a horse and a pig. So we were, we were able to get our own food. We didn't have to go to the grocery store and buy all that kind of stuff. We used, to, we used to go to Christmas parties at the community center. 
and um, we were at the community center one Christmas. I got out into the car, and my little brother forgot his present, so I ran in to get the present, and my family forgot me. I was six years old, so I had to walk home at Christmas in the snow by myself, crying all the way. And then when I got home, my family hadn't even missed me. That was very sad. <laughs> that was one Christmas that I remember very, very much. I was born in Brattleboro. In 1949, I lived in East Putney. Around 1926, my grandfather purchased a um, farm in East Putney and became dairy farmers. When I grew up in Putney, it, um, it consisted of, my, most of my friends were dairy farmers, um, and other friends' parents either worked in the paper mill or the basket factory, or they were teachers at either Wyndham College or Putney School. Wyndham College was located in the center of Putney, which was um, a lot of activity, partying and chaos at different times. And then in, I think it was in the 19, late 1960s, they built a, a campus, which is now Landmark college. I hunted right up until I shot my first deer and then um, I never hunted again after that. I had this um, funny feeling about killing something. When I shot this deer it wasn't quite dead um, so it had to be shot again and, um, and it kind of changed my attitude toward hunting. I went to first grade at the um, community center in Putney. And second grade was at the central school at the top of Kimball Hill, the white building. And then in fourth grade came to the central school. My favorite memory at the community center was every Tuesday night we would come and play basketball here. And that was the, that was the best time that I remember as a child here. Well, it looked pretty much the same way it does today. Um, they made some changes in the bathrooms, but basically what you see is pretty much the way it was back in the 1950s. Well, I liked the idea um, when I was a kid of it was more of a rural community and we worked on farm. We kind of changed more from an agricultural community to more of a commuter town. I think I appreciate having the opportunity to grow up in a small town where everyone knows everybody and um, you felt like you were always part of something. And I think now I still feel that way. Well, my name is Eva Munden, and I came to go to Antioch Graduate School, which was up on Putney Mountain, in 1969. I was born in Central Florida. I'm of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and that as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch. That I've got hold of for a moment 
and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it off to future generations. That's you all. So it says how to strengthen community. It's kind of faded, but take a look at some of those. I think that uh, all of those are really relevant. Well, it's changed quite a lot in terms of, uh, let's say, when I came, Wyndham College existed, and now it's Landmark College, and it went through a period of time where there was nothing happening there at the school, and they'd thought about turning it into a federal prison, but thank goodness, uh, a couple of people on the select board, Governor Shumlin, uh, he was on the select board then, and he'd heard about this school, Landmark School, in Brattleboro, which was for high school, not in Brattleboro, in Boston, which was for high school students. And they had wanted to expand into a college. So that's how, that's what happened there. And now it's a four-year college. Also, Greenwood School, a school for uh, uh, young men with learning challenges, uh, now exists. So that's interesting. And the school, the grammar school existed, but now it's expanded. And so I think that all the schools that exist in the area have had a big influence on the community. Okay? Uh, other ways it's changed. Well, some of the very gifted elders of the community have died and passed on. So that is the change. They were remarkable. People like Esther Ponick, Connie St. John, Edith and Nancy West. These were the elders, some of the elders, as many, many, as things have changed everywhere, Putney has changed in terms of uh, we still have the co-op, we still have the uh, River Valley Credit Union, which used to be the Putney Credit Union. Those two started here in Putney, quite famous. Some very progressive businesses were here. We still have the general store was here. It's gone through, as you all know in your lifetime, burned down started to rebuild, burned down again, and now it has the pharmacy. That's quite remarkable to have a pharmacy in the village. So that's good. Come on over and let's take a picture of this peace pole, which I helped, uh, I fundraised for and got permission to put in. And I think that's so symbolic of if we can have peace in our homes and communities, then we can certainly work for peace on a national and international level. So I came here in 1941, Was when I was about 13. There were four of us, four kids, so it was a little crowded. Youngest had to sleep downstairs in a kind of little ante room, but yeah, we, we didn't have, we had plumbing, but we had, a, you know, no, no town septic system, like an old farmhouse or something. I went to Putney School. I started there in the eighth grade, and that's, uh, that's where I met, met my wife. It was a very, you know, co-ed prep school, very liberal. It started in 1935. I worked at Darrell's Orchard in the summer. I started working there. Ten cents an hour. <laughs> I work all morning, earn 45 cents. Then I went to Dartmouth, went there four years. Later I taught mathematics at Putney School. I was in the Navy in 1951 to 1953, so I was in during the Korean War. We practiced a lot of landings in the in the Mediterranean. I was on a oh APA, a big ship that carried uh, 27 landing boats. You know these boats that go up on the beach and the ramp goes down. Yeah, we had 27 of those. We had a thousand Marines on board. They were the guys we put in the boats and sent them into the beach. And I was lucky. In 1951, I made the Olympic ski team combined cross-country and jumping and so I went to the Olympics in 1952 when I was in the Navy they a fellow student friend of mine from Dartmouth was in the Navy and he was uh, working in Washington and he knew I'd made the Olympic team so he called up special services and he said hey do you know you've got a guy Caldwell over there in Naples on a ship and he's on the Olympic team weren't you? and the guy in special services said oh my goodness so they they gave me orders they I got orders in Naples to report to Sun Valley for training 
very poorly. <laughs> I, I wasn't prepared. I mean, we went to Norway. We had no idea how good they were. There was no information around the United States how to train cross country, how to jump or anything like that. At first, I was just learning to ski and started racing, ninth grade. Or, yeah, 1951, the year after college, they had the tryouts in the East, and I was second in both tryouts, so they put me on the Olympic team. I coached three or four or five Olympic teams and some world championship teams and some other teams. I wrote a book on cross country, and uh, they call me the father of cross country skiing in the United States. Yeah, I try skiing a little bit cross country. I kind of shuffle along. <laughs> I, <laughs> this, uh, yeah. So that's about it. Family's been around for, for a while. My, my grandmother, Inez Harlow, is probably one of the more famous Harlows in town. She came up, um, and she was a teacher first. Uh, taught, um, I think she taught way back before they had a central school. They had the one-room schools all over the, all over the place. And then after that, she became the town clerk. And she was town clerk for a whole bunch of years. So if you ask people in town, a lot of them know know of Inez Harlow. She's, she's been around for quite, quite some time, was quite around. She's, she's gone now. Grandfather Harlow actually wa worked in Lowell, Massachusetts, and he, on Sunday night, he used to go up to Bellows Falls, get on a train, go down to Lowell, and he worked for GE down there, and then on Friday night, he'd take the train back up and they'd pick him up in Bellows Falls. So he, he was a commuter uh, back, back in those, those days. It was my great uncle, his his brother, that actually was the, the farmer. My great uncle Frank bought this piece of land in 1928, and he graduated from the University of Massachusetts with a degree in horticulture. So he came up and bought this farm and started raising mostly fruit. And my father got out of the service in 1954, and he joined him then. It was very busy. It was before 91 was in here. I think I mentioned before, this Route 5 used to be the main road that clear through to Canada. Um, when 91, uh, when they put 91 in, it really dropped the amount of people that were just driving by. So uh, the type of gift shop that we have that was designed to have people pull, just pull off the road just because they, they saw it. Um, doesn't work that way anymore. Now, uh, it works during foliage season. People come wheel drive around just during foliage season, but most of the time they don't drive up Route 5 just to see what's going on. The price of gas is more expensive, and they don't they don't do it that way anymore. Coming up Route 5. They when they do come up, like I say, fall foliage is is our biggest uh, time for tourists, and we've had we've had times when this whole parking lot is full. All, all day long but that nowadays Columbus Day weekend uh, it'll fill up now um, maybe the weekend after and the weekend before but pretty much at, uh, other than those weekends we really don't have a lot of tourists that just come. The whole farm is about 200 acres um, a big chunk of that is sugar bush um, there's about 12 acres of apples 16 acres of blueberries four acres of raspberries, four acres of strawberries, and a whole bunch of land that just holds the world together. You know, it's just stuff. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Farm was like, uh, the milking was all done by hand, and we had the weed gardens, the big garden, because back then, uh, up until I think around 47 or 48, somewhere in there, there was no electricity. So the meat that we had 
Uh, we never knew what beef was, but pork and deer was our main two meat sources. And my mother used to can a lot of that, and she canned probably three, four hundred quarts of stuff every season for us. We had, back when I was growing up, we had a good time, but it wasn't like today. We didn't have the cars and all that stuff. We, most of ours was from walking or riding bicycles, and we didn't have swimming pools. We had to go to brooks and swim, and we worked a lot on the farms and on, to help out for means of surviving. How are we related to Senator Reagan? Uh, distant cousins. You're talking about uh, Senator Reagan. I remember them telling me his last election year cost him $13 and I think it was 78 cents for his election. We uh, didn't have the conveniences you people had today. We had wood stoves for heat. Uh, when I was started growing up over by the Kernhattan home, there was no electricity. Uh, everything was done with kerosene lamps. And the winter, what few neighbors it was, it was more to a family type reunion back then than it is today. Where today, I believe everybody going separate ways back then. It was a lot of families. And you didn't have the stores open on Sunday. That was family day. You might have a store open to get your paper and milk in the morning for a couple hours and that was it. Uh, the biggest thing, trouble I think with this country today is greed, money. There's no, uh, the people don't seem to get along as well. They want to sue you or there's no helping each other out or nothing. And that's the biggest trouble right today. I grew up in the Netherlands and I uh, came to Putney because of my marriage to George Shumlin, which took place in Putney in 1952. And since 1952, except for two years in the early 50s, I've lived here. I would not want to live anywhere else. That is genuine. So I love it here. When I first got here, I was very young, I was 21, and I had not lived in the United States before. And so I'd say the first year living here, well, it was wonderful to be with my husband. I had no friends of my own, I had left all my friends behind. So it was an adjustment in many ways. My husband and I started an organization called Putney Student Travel, which sent high school kids to Europe, at the time Europe, now it's the entire world, um, for educational purposes. And during the year we organized it, and then in the summer the trips went. And it started out with two trips, and now it's a very large organization run by my son Jeffrey. And I believe we now send something like 3,000 students a summer. During middle school, we were occupied by the Germans and uh, that had a profound, probably the most profound uh, experience of my life was living in the Netherlands during the occupation. And uh, th this happened in 1940 on the 10th of May uh, when we were overrun by the Germans because the Dutch had been uh, neutral in the first 
uh, World War, which was from 1914 to 1918. And uh, we thought we were going to be neutral again. However, we were sadly mistaken, and we had a, an army that was totally unprepared for an attack by the Germans, and the Germans took over the Netherlands in five days. That came when I was eight, nine. So when I was in middle grade, we were just in when I was getting really tough being occupied. And uh, at a certain point, schools closed that was the reason for it being is that the winter 1940 you have to understand that the germans were losing and most of western europe had been liberated but not the little area where i lived the southern part of holland was free but not where the big cities are amsterdam the hague and rotterdam and i am from the hague uh, and it became uh, what we call it, it's referred to uh, as the hunger winter because food became extremely scarce. And uh, also, of course, uh, heating people in those days usually heated by wood stoves or coal stoves, and neither wood nor coal was available. Uh, the consequence of which was that the, the Hague had some beautiful forests that were totally cut down because everybody needed the wood, wood and went out there and, uh, and cut down the trees and eventually even you know, got so cold that they cut up their less desirable furniture and put it in the stove. So schools closed, but they did send you with a um, list of tasks, with always gave you homework, although there wasn't anybody to teach you. So the problem was to do the homework, to be hungry, <laughs> and to keep on functioning. That was when I was your age. Long time. <laughs> I went to the Putney School in 1939, so you can figure it out. I went when I was quite young. Oh, I liked it a lot. It was fun. And I learned a lot, and I had fun. <laughs> I liked to study, and I liked the people there, and teachers were good. Really nice because you know a lot of people, and they know you, and that's fun. Oh, yeah, I've loved it. I've loved it. Went to school here, I loved it, and I went away, and then I came back. <laughs> Living is good. Living yeah. is good. Having children is good, grandchildren. There were three of us in the sixth grade. I met Johnny there. I always liked history and English. But sciences, no, not particularly. <laughs> I taught history. Cool. Oh, fun, it was great, it was great. The students were pretty engaged, and um, I liked it a lot. Those were the days. I went to Smith, to the University of Toronto, and I came back to Smith, and I thought Smith was better. And then I went out to the Middle West and taught for a couple of years, and then I came back. Well, it was Michigan, actually, not too far away. And it was, uh, okay, it was a girl's school. It was very different. It was very proper. <laughs> but I enjoyed it all right. Well, we're still here. We see our children eventually and occasionally. And our grandchildren, which is nice. And Putney's a great town, you know. You get to know people very well. Yeah, it's very cozy down. I love it. I wouldn't live anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's nice to be in a town that's small enough that you know a lot of the people. That's fun.